Father, we are grateful that there is no one else like you. We reached up and we touched the sky and we came to your throne of grace and now we stand here in your presence, Lord. As we are sinners in a need of a Savior and we thank you we thank you, Lord, that you receive us just like we are. And you provide us what we need. We thank you, Lord, that as we are gathered here in this house, you have our pastor there in Georgia ministering. And you're not separated or you're not hindered by distance, by time. And so we're grateful, Lord God, that we can all be in your presence and Lord as we prayed earlier before we came out on the platform we in your presence right now want to hold up to you Lord those that can't publicly worship you like we can right now our brothers and sisters in the Middle East and in China and Korea or North Korea and in Africa and other parts of the world Lord God where they don't have this freedom. We intercede and we hold them up to you and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to minister to each one. And we thank you, Father, that the liberty you've given to us, that we would not take it for granted, but that we would realize just how much of a blessing it is. And we ask you, Lord, to speak to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, and we have all said together, amen and amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Praise God. If you uh, don't get a chance to come on Thursday night, I just need to let you know you're really missing a real awesome time in the word. This past Thursday, our pastor shared with us. Actually, he asked a question first, and his question was this. Has there ever been a time when you found yourself in a place that you would really rather not be in? Have you ever found yourself in that kind of a place, that kind of a moment when you're kind of thinking, I really don't want to be here. Well, he shared with us out of the book of Jeremiah that it's in those kinds of places that God is working out a process. And that process is to bring forth the fruit that God has created us to produce. Now, I know a lot of times we would prefer to have the product and not go through the process. And that's what he shared Thursday night. We would rather have the product than the process. But, but Jesus said that people would know that we're his disciples by the fruit we bear. So that must mean that there are going to be times that we're going to find ourselves in a process to cause us to become more of the people that we need to be so that people will see the fruit and they will know who we belong to. There won't be any doubt about it. Now, in other parts of the world right now, that uh, when people are willing to stand up for the, for the name of Jesus, they find themselves facing death. We don't have that here. At least now, we don't know what could come. But something that we have to understand, that God is working on a process with each one of us. And um, for me, okay, I, 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 if it's okay, I'm just going to share with you what's going on in my life right now. And, and for me, this process means that God is 
wanting me to evaluate the abundance that's on the inside of me. Now, the reason he wants me to evaluate what is abundantly on the inside of me is because according to Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, it says, brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? This is the point I want you to see. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the process that I'm in in my life right now is that God's checking to see what I'm full of. Okay, you can take that any way you want to, all right? Again, I'm talking about myself here, okay? He wants me to check and see what I'm full of. Because depending upon what I'm full of means that it's not only could it come out of my mouth, but it can also manifest in my behavior. It, it could manifest in my... Now, I, I'm not saying, okay, that I'm outwardly cussing or saying terrible things out of my mouth or that I'm sinning, but it could be that because of what everyone else around me is saying or doing or, or involved in, that I could be getting influenced by what everyone else is saying and doing and Ultimately, it will affect what I say. And not only what I say, but how I say it. And then not only how I say it, but even how I sometimes feel. Because the abundance of what I'm hearing around me these days and the abundance of what I'm seeing around me these days is not making me necessarily feel very well. Now, again, I'm just talking about myself. But lately, I have to admit, I've been feeling like I've been carrying around a 100-pound bag of fertilizer on my head. And it just feels like the, the environment is just so thick with junk. And I'm just kind of like, ugh. And, 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 and my wife, every once in a while, will tell me, it's not what you said, honey. It's how you said it. And I'm looking at her going, what are you talking about? Well, because of the fact that I've been getting full of all this stuff that everybody else is saying around me and doing around me and thinking about around me and posting on Facebook, it's becoming a part of me. And so as I do this evaluation, I have to remember something. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, it says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Okay? So that means that if I'm spending a lot of time on Facebook, watching what everybody's talking about, sooner or later, I'm going to be feeling like a 100-pound bag of fertilizer on me. Because everybody's complaining about this person or that person or who you're going to vote for, who you're not going to vote for, or you're not going to vote. Well, then you should know what's in and on and on. On and on it goes. And then pretty soon that abundance kind of gets on the inside of you. And as Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 says, out of that abundance, my mouth's going to start to speak. And then as, it's, if I, as I start to speak it, and if I start to, to live it, People will be looking at me and I'll get one of these numbers. I thought you were a Christian. Okay, again, all right, I'm not pointing at anybody else here in the room. I'm just telling you what's going on in my life. But the reason that it's happening is because I'm letting all this stuff get on me. As a matter of fact, if you, if you flip over to Psalm 137, Psalms 137. The children of Israel, even now you might say, well, Dr. Seymour, didn't David write the Psalms? Well, yes, he is given credit for writing the Psalms, but not all the Psalms were written while David was alive. They were accumulated over a period of time. And in Psalm 137, starting at verse 1, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. 
Now, what that basically means is that some of the children of Israel, because the Babylonians were a very powerful empire at the time, had come into Israel, had come into Jerusalem, and were snatching people out of Israel, out of Jerusalem, and taking them to Babylon. Ultimately, the Babylonians would come in and overthrow the southern kingdom of Judah, and the people would be taken captive. But before that occurred, they were being harassed by the Babylonians. And so what the children of Israel were doing is they found themselves by the rivers of Babylon. It says that they wept when they remembered Zion. And I asked the Bible study class this morning, I mean, think about it. How many times do you sit there sometimes and going, I remember or remember when gas was only $1.25? You know, when a gallon, a gallon of milk was a buck? Whatever the case may be, you know, when, you know, you could write a check for your taxes without any problem because it was not so, anyway. Remember when? Well, see, that's exactly what the children of Israel doing. They were remembering when. But why was it that they had to remember? The reason they had to remember is because they had been consumed by the people around them. Verse 2, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away captive asked us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Verse 4 says, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? So what basically happened here is they began to think about what had been before they got so full and were consumed by the world around them. They were thinking, Remember when we used to sing that song? But now, because of the cir circumstances, they're so full of the circumstances, they can't even sing anymore. And then the Lord speaks a word. John chapter 8, verse 43. John chapter 8, verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. How is it that they could not hear his word? The reason that he couldn't hear his word is because of the fact that they were so full of what everybody else around them was saying they were so focused on what everybody else was saying and doing around them that all they could hear were the other voices. They couldn't hear what the Lord was saying. And then because they couldn't hear what he was saying, they didn't understand. Think about it. Elijah, where did he find himself? In a cave. And why was he in a cave? Because he was listening to the voice of a woman named Jezebel. And he ran into the cave and he hid there. And there was a storm and there was a fire and there was a shaking went on. And he's thinking, oh, maybe that's God. But he didn't hear God's voice there. It wasn't until he got quiet and got his attention off of all the loud noises and heard a still, small voice. And the Lord spoke to him. But he had to get away from that abundance so literally, what Jesus was saying here to his disciples, he's saying, the reason you don't understand my words, the reason that you can't hear my word is because you have an abundance of the other stuff in your life to the point that it keeps my word from finding a place in your ears and in your heart. And my word, now look at John chapter 15. My words I speak to you. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you, John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy would be full. Literally, what Jesus was saying is he's saying the word that I declare to you, the word that you have right now here in your lap, this word has been given so that you would have a portion of my joy. And my joy is the fact that I have created you 
Do you understand that God is excited because he has made you in his image and likeness and there is nobody else in the whole world has ever been or ever will be like you? And he says, I like that. And I'm going to do what it takes to get you to where I am. But if I'm not listening, or if I'm so full of all what everybody else around me is saying and what everybody else is doing, I'm not going to hear his voice. And then if I'm not going to hear his voice, then guess what? I'm not going to have joy. And not only am I not going to have joy, but I'm not going to have fullness of joy. I mean, I know, I know, again, I'm just talking about myself. But there are times I know somebody will come up to me and they say, what are you down for, Doc? What's, what's, what's happening? What are you so worried about? What, what's the matter? You don't look so happy. I'm not. Why? Well, and then you start thinking, why am I? Well, it's because, did you hear the news today? I was driving into work. I had the news on the radio. I got this message on the email, and I got Facebook, and I got text, and, and, and everybody's got a complaint, and I'm miserable. And the Lord reminded me, out of the abundance of my heart, out of what I consume, I'm going to become. You know why there's no joy in Mudville tonight? It's not because Casey struck out. It's because the body of Christ is so full of the world that there's no joy in the world around us today. And so what has to happen is that we have to kind of come to that place where we got to get our focus back. We've got to get our thinking back on track to where God needs it to be. So if it's okay, can I give you some things that he showed me that I need to do? Now, I, I know this isn't for anybody else here because I'm the only one with this problem right now. The rest of you all have got your act together. Thank you so much for loving me. But let me just share with you in case maybe somebody you know might need some of this information. Philippians chapter 2, a real simple line, verse 5. Paul wrote this, a very well-educated individual. And he had more education than I have. <laughs> and, but he needed some help to change the abundance that was in him. And here's what he wrote. Philippians chapter 2, did I say Philippians? Chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, we can go further, but I just want that portion right there. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Jesus, well... I'll go ahead and read a little bit more. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. Jesus became like me so that he could experience the same junk that I do. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, Doc, he lived 2,000 years ago. But 2,000 years ago, loneliness was still loneliness. 2,000 years ago, government intervention was still government intervention. 2,000 years ago, sexual immorality was still sexual immorality. 2,000 years ago, pride was still pride. Greed was still greed. And so having the mind of Christ who decided he wasn't going to be equal with God, but he was going to become like Dr. Seymour, 
or maybe whoever it is that you are going to share your notes with. Jesus became like you so that he could, in the midst of whatever I'm experiencing and that person you're going to talk to is experiencing, so he could go through all those same elements and learn how to deal with them the way that God intended them to be dealt with. Because, see, Jesus, even though he took on this form, he didn't let anything else fill it but God. Because he is God. And he wasn't going to change the contents. He just changed the container. Okay, so then Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. How many thoughts? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. You mean I got to consider everything I'm thinking about? Absolutely. Now I know probably, again, I'm just talking about myself. I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night with all kinds of bizarre things going through my head. Okay, again, I'm just talking about myself here. I know that nobody else is. And then... You know, I start wrestling with God in the midst of these conversations. Going, what, do you, what, do you, what is it that you want from me? Well, I need you to change what you're thinking about. I was sleeping. <laughs> the reason why you're thinking what you're thinking when you're sleeping is because you were thinking about it before you went to sleep because it had to come from somewhere. So what you've been hanging on to lately? Take it captive. So I get out of bed and I start walking to my office and sit down in the chair and go, okay, Lord, what else do I need to do here? Well, read what Peter says about this. I know we always look to Paul, but Peter, he's very much like you, Dr. Seymour. He opens his mouth and doesn't think about it and puts his foot in up to his kneecap. So why don't you read what Peter wrote about this thing, about taking every thought captive. So turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm sorry, chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's look at verse 13. Okay, remember this is Peter, open mouth, insert foot up to your kneecap. Peter. Again, just Dr. Seymour, he's the only one that says things wrong. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully. Okay, D -d does your translation say fully there? Okay, there's a reason it says fully. Because it says, remember we just heard Jesus say it in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the fullness of your heart, your mouth speaks. So if I'm going to change the way my mouth speaks, I'm going to have to fully get a hold of something else. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you want to change the way you say things, what you say, or how you act, you're going to have to get fully convinced that what God has declared to you is joy, and it's joy unspeakable, full of glory, and it's not based upon what everybody else is saying and doing or what is happening around you. It's based purely on what he has declared in his word. Now, have I gotten my act together yet? No. Did the children of Israel get their act together? No. I mean, think about it. They got so full of their circumstances that they quit singing. They quit singing. We sing some of the choruses that they sang in church. Pastor George talks about it all the time. He pulls out some of these songs and it's like I'm going, and he smiles at me going, don't you know what this song is, Doc? And I'm going, no. 
<laughs> You've been a Christian a little bit longer than I have. I don't know this song. So he teaches it to me. And, I, and you know, they're kind of fun. Uh, the songs that we did this morning, they're, fuck, they're, they're awesome. But if I get so consumed by what's happening around me and what people are saying and doing around me, pretty soon it's just going to be music. And it won't be an abundance. It'll just be words. And there won't be any joy. It'll just be, okay, it's time to play the bass. So I'm going to come over here and play the bass. Now, I, I know nobody else in the worship team ever. I'm just going to sit here at the keyboard. Uh, let's see. I'm going to play my horn. Oh, no, I'm going to play my guitar. Which mic do I get to use today, Tian? I don't get to use the mic. And then all of a sudden, there's this go discussion going on back here about who does or doesn't get... That's because you're so full of what everybody else is saying around you that you don't know how to talk to each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was only talking about myself. <laughs> what do you mean I don't get to play a solo? Hmm. I used to get to play a solo. I don't get to play a solo anymore. Mm, Tia, I'm mad at you. So is my wife, because she likes to hear me play solos. <laughs> but the only reason why I'm like that is because I'm listening to what the whole world is saying around me. I'm listening to what people are doing around me. I'm letting the circumstances dictate how I act. And Jesus said... My words will give you joy and it'll be full in the midst of what's going on. So either the problem is like the children of Israel who got so full of their circumstances they quit singing. Or I'm so full of bad news, lack of finances, circumstances, situations, the elections. That what is happening is that the abundance of my thoughts have so consumed me that I can't hear his voice anymore. So what do I need to do? I need to get the mind of Christ. I need to start taking my thoughts captive and I need to gird up the loins of my mind. Now, I don't know, you, most of you know, I had some surgery a few months ago. Not, not anything that I'd want to raise my hand and say, could I do that again? That was fun. <laughs> but hernia surgery is no fun. Let me tell you, there are still some moments but when Peter said, gird up, it was like having to cinch up myself when they had the surgery done to understand that this is going to hurt a little bit until it heals completely. And then once it heals completely, I might get able to be back to about 80%, but I'm going to have to wait a while before I get to be totally hung. So in other words, when it comes time to start getting my mind right, getting my, situa my, my thinking right, i got to understand that this process that God's taking me through to get me to the place where the product is more like him and less like me, i got to get ready for that process. And see, when I finally get to the point that the, I get a hold of the process that he wants me to get a hold of, I'm going to do like David did. You might remember this verse in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. It says that David strengthened himself in the Lord. You know how he strengthened himself in the Lord? It wasn't because circumstances were good, because all the guys that he was fighting with, they all wanted to kill him. These were his friends. They all wanted to kill him. His Wife and children and family has all been taken captive. He, his, the place where he was staying had been destroyed. 
So he was not looking at anything that was going on around him. What he was considering is that God allowed me to kill bears and lions and Goliath. And he anointed me to become king over Saul. So what he strengthened himself was not in anything that was going on around him. But it's what he had already known God had done. And so if I'm going to be able to strengthen myself in the Lord, i got to start thinking about what has God already done for me. And am I getting my thinking focused there? or am I stuck at watching what's going on around me that that still doesn't make any sense to you okay well look at the prophet Habakkuk Habakkuk chapter 3 look at verse 17 it's just a few pages to your left from Matthew 12 it's just a few pages to the left Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17 though the fig tree may not blossom nor fruit be on the vines though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herds in the stall. Okay, with just that one verse, you can basically pretty well see things are not going very well, are they? I mean, not to have any oil, I mean, not to have any olive uh, fruit or the olive, uh, is it a fruit? I don't know. Anyway, to not have any olives basically meant there was going to be no oil. If, that, if there was no oil, that means there was no light. So in other words, the electricity just got cut off. To have no food basically means that you go to open up the refrigerator, besides the fact that there's no light on because there's no electricity, there ain't nothing in there. When you go into the cupboard to see if you're going to fi find out whether or not you get your Cheerios or not, there's no Cheerios or fruit. Fruit Loops, I don't know, whatever it is that you've got to get. A, there's nothing there. But notice what verse 18 says. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. You know what Habakkuk looked at? He didn't look at the circumstances. He looked at knew what God would do as he would bring a provision. Even though he didn't see it right now, he knew that God in the past had brought provision. God, as a matter of fact, made made quail show up he made manna show up out of nothing he took he brought water out of the rock so just because i don't have nothing now doesn't mean it's going to be like that forever so i'm thinking about i'm going to rejoice about the god who will ultimately bring to me the thing that i need and then my thinking begins to change if you recall paul and silas they found themselves in a dungeon in acts chapter 16 as a matter of fact, they weren't just in any old dungeon. They were in the darkest, deepest part of the dungeon. They were kind of like where the cesspool was, where everything drains out of this building. It fell down into this lower part, and that's where they were. And not only were they there, but their feet were chained to the floor. Now, I would say at that particular point, it's pretty stinky. It's nasty. If you have to go... Your feet are chained to the floor, so all you can do is scoot over. And then when you're done, you got to scoot back. That was it. Dr. Seaman, that's a little gross. We're in church. But, I mean, think about it. That's what they were in. So they moaned and groaned. No. Acts 16.25 says, At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to the Lord. And God moved supernaturally. He moved supernaturally and shook that place so hard that every chain came off of every prisoner. Every locked door popped open. And the, and the jailer thought for sure everybody would escape. So he was ready to kill himself. And Paul yelled out, no, don't kill yourself. Come here, come here, come here. See, you'll see everybody's still here. Why? Because God did something supernatural because out of the abundance of Paul and Silas's heart, they sang. They weren't focused on the circumstance. They were focused on the God who could deliver them. And he did. And he opened up the door and broke the chains. When Jesus was confronted with what was about to occur to him, he said in Luke chapter 22, Father, I pray that you would take this away from me. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. 
He spoke what the Lord, what the Father wanted. Not what his flesh wanted. He spoke what the Father wanted. So here's the deal. What language? Again, talking about Dr. Seamer. Dr. Seamer, the Holy Spirit wants to know what language are you speaking? Are you speaking what you're hearing everybody else say? What those around you are saying? The way that they're saying it and the things that they're involved in? Or are you speaking the things that God speaks? And the thing that will set you free is when you begin to start speaking the language that he speaks. When you begin to start saying the things that he says. When you begin to start taking your mind captive and saying, okay, Lord, I need your thought life in me. Fill me up. Shut off the world. Shut off Facebook. Shut off Twitter. Shut off my whatever. Just be quiet, world. Lord, speak. And then the abundance from me will be he. And you will see and hear his voice. For those in the church today, the only way you're going to, first of all, get God's voice out of yours if you have a relationship with him. You can't speak his words if you're not connected to him. So maybe this morning there might be somebody here that doesn't know Jesus. You don't have a relationship with him. Oh, you're here in church, but, you know, you kind of just are going through the motions. You know, a little bit like I, I go through the motions a little bit. But see, God's changed me because he reminded me that I started a relationship 40 years ago with him. At the age of 25, I said, okay, God, if you can do something with this old biker, do it. And he has. And I'm here this morning. So is there anyone in this room that has never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart? You've never said, Lord, I need what you have. Will you forgive me? And will you use me just like I am? Is there anyone here? Would you just be willing to raise up your hand and say, Dr. Seymour, that's me. I'm, again, I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand and say, that's me. I need Jesus in my life. Yes, my sister Ruthie, I see your hand. I appreciate the fact that you want to stay close to him. And I believe that what you're looking for might be what some other people in this room are looking for. You have a relationship with Jesus, but it's not the way it should be because you're more full of what the world's saying than what Jesus says. You know better what the front page newspaper said today than what the Word of God says. You know better what CNN or Fox News said this morning than what the Word of God says. God's calling you to take that thought captive and surrender it to Him and let Him rise up on the inside of you and make you a new person. Is there anyone in this room that could say the same way that I would? I have. I've already submitted myself to the Lord and said, okay, God, I get it. I've been thinking wrong. I'm getting my, my, my thinking fixed. I can't stand up in front of people and say, get your mind fixed if I'm not going to do it. So I'm not telling you something I haven't already done. And what I have done and what I'm going to continue to do every day is that when I get too full of myself or get too full of the world, I'm going to say, Father, forgive me. Get this out of me. Fill me up with your word. And I'm going to spend more time here than I do watching TV or watching Facebook or listening on the radio to what the idiots are saying. Anybody else in this room need to say, yep, that's me, Dr. Seamer. I need to be doing that. I need to start getting myself full. Thank you for raising your hands. Just put it up. Just put it up. It's okay. Put it up. Put it up and say, that's me. That's me. Okay. Leadership, join me up here because we're going to be praying for people this morning. We're going to be praying to help people take captive their thoughts, to take their thought lives captive and saying, God, I need your help to get my thought life right because I'm more full of the word than I of the world than I am of the word. And I'm going to say today, this day, I'm putting that that full world stuff 
down and I'm going to pick up what God says. So as the leadership is joining us, as I ask you to stand as you begin this ministry of song, if you need to pray and ask someone to just agree with you in prayer that you need to get rid of the world thinking in your mind and get a hold of God thinking, then you come out of your pew and you come up here and pray with somebody and get an agreement with somebody. Let's get the house clean so that we can be the body that we need to be. If we need to split people up, please let's make, make sure everybody gets somebody to pray with them. Please.